Hi. Okay, who out there is a Beatles fan? Well, you're looking at one right here. And honestly, you guys, I'm really nervous and excited because I'm about to interview a Beatle right now. Today, I'll be talking to the Beatles' original drummer, Pete Best. Honestly, I've been waiting my whole life to make a Beatle connection like this one. That's about to happen right now. So please hold my hand and come with me while I interview straight from Liverpool, Beatle Pete Best. Oh, and by the way, I'm Dr. Jen Palladino, a chiropractor who specializes in the treatment of musician and performing artist's injury. Music and the creative arts can change the world, and I'm interested in exploring the passion that music and art evokes in people, whether it's playing or listening or creating or observing. It's that powerful driving force within the human soul that sparks emotion, unites the masses, bridges language and cultural barriers, and heals the body, mind, and spirit. You're watching Rockin' Healthy Lifestyles on the Dr. Jen Palladino YouTube channel. So sit back, get ready, and let's go. Welcome to Rockin' Healthy Lifestyles, a podcast featuring conversation with popular musicians and performing artists, sharing their stories of life's trials and triumphs, career ups and downs, and what stirs their creative juices. Also join us and learn how our guests keep fit and fabulous while rocking a healthy body, mind, and spirit. And now, introducing your host, Dr. Jennifer Palladino. Hello there, and thank you for tuning in to Rockin' Healthy Lifestyles. I couldn't be more excited about today's episode. We have a true legend in the world's popular music with us. And if you're a Beatles fan, and let's face it, you know, who isn't? You're in for a really fantastic treat. Joining me today is none other than the original Beatle drummer, often hailed as the fifth Beatle, Pete Best. From those electrifying nights at the Casbah Club, that's right, not the Cavern, the Casbah Coffee Club, where the Beatles first began to carve out their legendary sound, to the iconic performances on Hamburg's Germany scene, Pete was there at the very beginning, his drumming laid the groundwork for the Beatles' early sound, and his experiences with the band are truly the stuff of legend. I am thrilled to delve into his memories, his experiences, and his unique perspective on what it was like to be part of music history in the making. So welcome, Pete. Welcome. Okay. Thanks, Viv. That was some intro that Jen. That was some intro that oh, yeah. Jen. Yeah. Oh yeah. I couldn't I couldn't do you any <laughs> service there, believe me. <laughs> But I first wanted to mention up front, your book, Pete, is entitled Beatles, The Pete Best Story, mm -hmm. and it offers an extraordinary memoir with a unique glimpse into the early days of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. It covers the band's formative years, their time in Hamburg, and the creation of Liverpool's iconic music scene. And the book really sheds light on the friendship, the camaraderie, the struggles and the triumphs that shaped the Beatles' yeah. rise to mm. fame. So mm. thank you very much for this vital piece mm. of rock and roll history. Also, too, I want to mention that your brother mm. Rogue's book, which is um, entitled The Beatles, The True Beginnings, um, also details those formative years mm -hmm. and the role mm -hmm. of the Casbah Coffee Club. Uh, the photos in the book are off the charts. Rogue has also been actively involved in managing and promoting the Beatles' history. So both those books are really fantastic. And um, definitely, if you're a Beatles fan, you, you really have to read them. Okay, sounds good to me. Now, just a quick disclaimer, um, at which I like to start in the very beginning which is Rock and Healthy Lifestyles has a very diverse listening audience of different ages and stages. And some listeners are longtime Beatles fans from the start. 
And then we have the younger generation of people who love well, the music, but they're not familiar with the details mm -hmm. of the history. Mm -hmm. So if I come across a little bit like a elementary or primary school teacher, it's because I want to give a review for the Beatles fans that are longstanding, but, you know, also the younger Beatles fans can really learn about the history. So thank you for being patient with me there. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. So I'd like yeah. to start off, Pete, with your early days. Can you share some of the details about where you were born and about your family? Yeah. Um, um, I was born in India, um, November 1941 in Madras, which is now called Chenna. And the reason for that was um, my mother was part of a large military family which had been out, English military family, which had been stationed out in India since the time of the Raj. So that goes way back into the Victorian times. And um, she was growing up there. Um, she was going to end up being trained as a nurse for the Red Cross, uh, but then she fell in love with my father, John, and uh, that was the reason why I was born out there. And we stayed out there till the end of the war. Uh, and then the end of the war was 1945. We were told um, when the war ended that, because uh, Dad was an officer, you know, he was, a, he was a captain. He was in charge of the famous Gurkha regiment, um, which the world knows how famous the Gurkhas were as fighters and as, you know, heroes in the Second World War. And it was very much a case of um, they were advised to, you know, go back to the port of call, you know, and he was a Liverpool, and he was born in Liverpool. So it, he mentioned it to my mother, Mona, and turned around and said, well, I'd like to go back to Liverpool. And Mo turned around and said, fine. Because at that stage, we knew that India was going to, you know, try and get its independence, which it did, you know, a couple of years later. Um, but at that time, it seemed logical and seemed sensible that we'd go back to to Liverpool, which was that hometown. So, to be quite honest, Jen, uh, 1945, we were on the last troop ship out of India um, on the Georgic, uh, SS Georgic. And that was the last ship that brought out the remainders of uh, General Sim's army, you know, the famous Chindits, you know, all the officers and, you know, the troops that were remaining there. And we were on that last troop ship out of India. It should have come into Liverpool um, round about, if my memory serves me right, uh, beginning of December. That was the schedule that was due for it. So we were going to be back in Liverpool for Christmas. Um, but we were delayed because of storms um, with horrible gales and hurricanes. And, you know, we ended up getting into Liverpool uh, Christmas Eve 1945. That's when we actually docked in Liverpool. And uh, it was quite a culture shock for me um, because you got to remember I'm a four-year-old kid being running around India, you know, and blazing heat and on sandals and beaches and shorts and everything. And there I am, clutched to the side of the... Uh, the rails of the Georgia, looking into, you know, fog-laden Liverpool and freezing cold. So that was my first memory of Liverpool, yeah. My goodness. And you were four years old when, when you you moved there. Yeah, yeah, when I landed, yes. Yeah. So uh, I'd have just turned four, born in 41, we landed in Christmas 45. So yeah, it was just about four and a, and a four and a little bit, four and a little bit. <laughs> so, so there are three brothers, right? You're the oldest, mm -hmm. and then you have a brother, Rory. That's right. Yeah. And a brother, Rogue. That's right. Yeah. What's the the age difference between you guys? Uh, Rory was born out in India as well. He was born in um, Delhi, alongside me. Uh, so he was a a scouser born in India. Another one in the best family. Uh, there's four years difference between Rory and myself, and. Um, then there's the big gap. Um, so between myself and Rogue, I think there's a difference of about 21 years, you know, so... Uh, oh, goodness. Wow. Yeah, but, wow. you know, okay. age doesn't count. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're family, age nope. doesn't count, you know. And yeah. we, we've done an Good awful point. lot together, believe you me. But I'm yes. not going to go into yes. that on this podcast. <laughs> okay. 
Well, let's talk about 8 Haymans Green. Now, that's the address in West Derby area of Liverpool of the house you grew up in. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a big house. What is it like? 15 rooms in a big backyard or when did you move into 8 Haymans Green? Uh, that would be around about 1956. Um, but the funny thing was, Jen, uh, before that, we, my mother had seen the house. Uh, Rory had seen it coming back from school because he used to walk down Amon's Green coming back from school um, to our other house, which was, again, in West Starby Village, but was, you know, a lovely semi-detached house. And he came and he, he turned, my, turned around and saw my mother Mona and turned around and said, Mo, he said, I've just passed an old Victorian mansion, um, which is derelict. You know, it's overgrown, but it, it, you might be interested in it. And she turned around and said, oh, it sounds very interesting. So she went and had a look at it, Jim. Fell in love with the place. Um, it, despite its derelict appearance and everything, she loved it. And she came back and saw my father, John, and she basically turned around and said, John, thinking about, you know, would you consider buying a new house? And he turned around and said, Mona, he said, I'm quite happy where I am. He said to me, he said, it's a big white elephant. So, uh... He turned around and said, no, I'm not interested. What we didn't know, and for those of you who know or knew Mona, um, she's a very determined, very courageous woman, okay? And if you read the books and, you know, listen to the folklore of Liverpool, you, you realise what a legendary character she was and still is. Um, she went away. She didn't tell anyone. She pulled all her jewellery and she betted on an outsider, um, a horse that was run in the 1954 Derby, okay, and it was being uh, ridden by a young jockey called Lester Piggott when went on to worldwide acclaim, and it was an American horse called Never Say Die, and it was an outsider at 33 to 1, okay. But the key factor was Jen, she pawned all her jewellery and bet it on Never Say Die, okay, to win. Not odds on. And she wing. won. She won. Oh my it gosh. won. Um, won't say now to tell you what her actions were in the kitchen because it was, it was quite hilarious to watch. Um, but she went from being this cool, calm, placid, you know, endearing lady to this screaming banshee, which was running around the kitchen saying, and I was saying, I've won my house. I've won my house. It was then that she basically turned around and told the rest of the family, their sons, um, what she'd done. And we basically turned around and said, oh, that's absolutely fantastic, Mona, you, you've got your house. Um, well, what was the flip side of it if you'd lost? And she turned around and said, I never even thought about that. Didn't cross her mind. And the funny thing was, Jen, and again, another feather in a cap. If I remember right, she became the first woman in England to get a mortgage. So that's, a, that's how she acquired eight things for yeah. Wow, that's huge. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. So your mom, Mona Best, was affectionately known and referred to as Mo. Mm -hmm. And she really shaped the Liverpool music scene in the late 50s and 60s. She was a visionary music promoter in her own right at that time. Describe your mom. Like, what was she like? Uh, how long do you want me to talk for? 365 days a year? I could talk about it, but no, putting it into perspective, how would I portray Mona, an endearing woman, very courageous, uh, very forthright. Um, she had a vision um, that she wanted to bring music to the kids of Liverpool, and that's what she did. And you, you take all those elements, you know, the people who knew her, she'd regale them with stories about, you know, her life in India. And so they were mesmerized by the, you know, the, the stories that she used to tell, you know, of her childhood in India. Um, but she was also, when the club opened, um, the kids in the club, she became an agony aunt to them, you know. Um, anyone who had the troubles, they'd go and see Mona. You know, she was like a second mom. You know, the Casbah was a, a second family home for most of the Casbah the members. Um, and that was all because of Mona. And you take all that characteristic and put it into, you know, the ideas she had and the strength of character and, you know, 
how adventurous she was. You know, I suppose that's the best thing. She was doing things that, you know, any other woman in Liverpool wouldn't even be th thinking of doing. They'd be living a normal housewife. You know, yes, she was living a housewife, but she was a housewife extraordinaire, if I could put it that way. Um, and because of that, because of her involvement at that early stage and the vision she had for Liverpool and the, the, the family itself, um, the media so rightly named her the mother of Mercy Beath, you know, many, many years afterwards. Oh, no. And it's a, a title we've always been proud of, the fact that the media and the press single moan her out to be the mother of Mercy Beath, which is absolutely incredible. You know what? I I think your next book should be a, a biography of Mona Best. Well, I mean, I think that would be magnificent if you haven't already begun. No, to... Well, there you see, we may have already started, Jen. We may ah. have already started. Oh, yeah. I'm so happy. Okay, well, that's a whole nother podcast, <laughs> and and it will be will be. So, Pete, how did you become interested in music, like? What what did you listen to during your formative years? Oh, God, like any other kid in Liverpool, Jen. Um, you know, Liverpool's always been a hotbed um, of music, you know, before the rock and roll and, the, the, you know, the Mercy Beats exploded. The, you know, Liverpool was a hotbed in as much as, you know, big bands, jazz music, Trinidad, steel bands, um, you know, singers, um you know, versatile musicians, uh, organists, you know, guitarists, piano players. There was a wealth of talent in Liverpool long before the Beatles came along, you know, so, and there still is a wealth of talent in Liverpool. is still an explosive place for, you know, musicians to live in. Um, but my my involvement was like basically listening, the initial involvement in listening to records, you know, American records on the charts, because even though we listened to the English rock and rollers, the Americans at that time seemed to have the edge on us. Um, so we were listening to the likes of, oh, Eddie Cochran, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, you know, all the greats, Carl Perkins. And then, I suppose with the advent of the Casbah Club opening, which was around about the 29th of August, 1959, I then became aware of the fact that I could actually see live music in the cellars of my house. Now, that for a kid in Liverpool was absolutely fantastic. It was unheard of. Because when I basically used to go home um, and do my homework, sometimes, you know, once that was done <laughs> and I had my tea, then it was down into the cellars to open the club and to help out. So the the Caswell was very much a family run business. Um but because of that mm. it gave me the the insight to see any of the music that was getting played down there. And of course my first insight into the band that played there was the Quarry Men, which was the lineup of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and uh, no drummer, another dear friend of mine called Ken Brown. They were just four guitarists. And I watched them on that particular opening night, Jim, and it was very much a case of John took the front of the stage for the first song, and he turned around and basically went, I'm going to play you some rock and roll. And he did, and I think he kicked off with a Chuck Berry number, maybe you know, sweet little 16 or something along those lines. And the place he rocked it, and I stood in the audience, I was there watching as a visionary and as a fan, uh, also there just in case there was any trouble that I could possibly help out with, like, you know, as, as with their instruments or anything like that. And it became apparent even from that very, very early stage that there was something about these guys, okay, musically-wise, the way they look character-wise, the material they were doing, which no other bands in Liverpool were doing at that time. Um, the likes of the Coasters, the likes of Carl Perkins, Everly Brothers. They could sing harmonies. It wasn't a frontline singer. They all sang individually. They all sang together. When you take that blend, then I just stood there and I was memorised, mesmerised. And then, of course... I became involved in music myself. I'd formed my own little band, the Blackjacks, which did well in Liverpool, and consequently it was also me playing drums with the Blackjacks. Um, I got the offer from Paul McCartney. He phoned me up and basically turned around and said, we've seen you playing drums, Pete, and we've heard you playing with the Blackjacks, and we've had the offer to go to Germany. And this is around about August 1960 now, Jen. And uh, he said, how do you feel about it? You know, see that... We said, I think we're going over there for a month initially. So I said, yeah, sounds good. 
and I'll go and check it with my own boys, which I did. And then I went and checked it with my family, which he did. And so your mum and dad. And uh, they said, yeah, if it's something you want to do, go. So I went back to Paul. I turned around and said, yeah, I've checked it all out. I'm quite happy to go along. And uh, he said, that's fine, Pete. He said, OK. He said, you're going to have to audition. And that struck me as rather funny because they'd seen me playing, um, but they wanted me to audition anyway. So he turned around and said, um, audition, we're going to audition you at the White Van Club, which later became the Blue Angel Club in Liverpool. So the following day, I threw my drums in a taxi and off I went and played about six numbers, uh, blasted them about just standard stuff that was going on in Liverpool. And then he went away in a corner. There was, by this time, Steve Sutcliffe had joined him. Okay, he was the bass player. And uh, they went away in a corner and mutter, 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 mumble, mumble. And about 10 minutes later, Alan Williams came into the club and they turned around and said, Alan, meet Pete, the new drummer. Okay, and Alan Williams stayed around and said, okay. He said, but, he said, be honest with you, Pete. He said, it was a foregone conclusion. We'd seen you playing and we liked what we saw. And, uh, you know, um, so I turned around and said, yeah, okay, that's fine, Alan. But why did you make me audition if you'd already seen me before? So he said, oh, that, that was quite simple, Pete. He said, we made you audition just in case you asked for more money. So... <laughs> That was how I was accepted into the Beatles. Yeah. And of course, yeah, and a couple of days after that, we were on this incredible journey to Hamburg, which was the whole start of an incredible adventure, you know, which lasted for many, many years. So this guy, Alan Williams, now, you know, of course, everybody knows that Brian Epstein was manager of the Beatles, but what was Alan Williams' connection to Hamburg? Well, to be quite honest, I suppose his connection with the Hamburg was he'd, he'd been out there, he'd, he'd looked at the scene. Um, a Liverpool band there in the scene, he's had gone out there, he was responsible for them being out there. And we were like the second wave that was going in, if you understood what I mean by that. And um, his connection to Hamburg was very much that he was one of the first managers, who I suppose, realised um, that there was a a whole new scene out there, um, you know, which was open for, you know, the Liverpool bands and he really wanted to be part of it. And consequently, that's why it was like, the, you know, the supposed to turn around and see the first person in Liverpool to start shipping bands out to, uh, uh, to Hamburg. Um, first of all, it was Derry, then of course it was the Beatles uh, and, you know, a few others which he was involved with. Um, but initially, Alan as a character, um, incredible. Okay. Uh, the racist, how could you put it, devil may care Welshman. <laughs> um, uh, do like to drink, um, but live life to the full, you know, and he, he enjoyed himself. And I, I've always turned around and said, if it most probably hadn't been for Alan getting us out to Germany on that initial trip, you know, maybe the Beatles would never have gone on to be what the world recognises them for today. So, you know, we owe a wow. lot to him, you know. Um, even though yeah. Brian Epstein takes the acclaim as being the official Beatles manager, you know, there mm. were managers before that who, who need to be well spoken about, and Alan's one of them. Mm. So Alan Williams owned clubs in Liverpool, and Bruno Koschmider? Koschmider, Koschmider? Yeah. Kashmir owned clubs in Hamburg. Mm. Was it a reciprocal thing? Was that the link between really Liverpool bands and? No, because we yeah, not at that stage. I think two or three years later, um, some of the German bands, like the likes of the Rattles, uh, which emanated as a result of the you know the Liverpool music scene coming to to Hamburg. Um, that became reciprocal in as much as they played at the cabin and they played, you know, in, in England. But in the early days, um, there was no reciprocal arrangement. If a Liverpool band went out there, you know, there was no consequential German band that came to Liverpool, you know, to be placed. It was very much a case of, you know, we were the front line, um, you know, we were going into it. And it, I suppose Bruno Koschmider, in his own word as well, he'd seen bands. And he realised that if he brought the Liverpool bands in, 
you know, to Hamburg. Then he was bringing, you know, a new sound in um, and something that was different to the kids. You know, instead of listening to it on the jukeboxes and air and the, you know, the the bands that were going on in the, in the clubs at that time, which were very much, you know, the Italian Marino Marini type or German umpa bands or something like that. But he was the, sort of, had realised that if he brings the Liverpool bands in to Hamburg, then, you know, the kids weren't just hearing the music on the jukebox. They were actually seeing right. it live. Live. And... You know, he was a, he was a front runner. If it hadn't been, you know, because of him wanting to bring bands into Liverpool again, you know, maybe not on that this would have happened. Mm. So, so by the time you first your first trip to Hamburg, mm -hmm. um, so run me through this. the 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 band went from the being the Quarrymen to Johnny and the Moon Dogs. Mm -hmm to Long John and the Silver Beatles, mm -hmm. to the Silver Beatles, mm -hmm. to the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That sounds about right, Jen, yeah. There were so many okay. different formats. Okay. Um, and I suppose the penultimate <laughs> one was when we went out to Germany. On the way over to Germany, the, the Silver Beatles, uh, we'd made the conscious decision that we were dropping the silver and we were just going to become the Beatles. And uh, it was quite funny, actually, because the first poster that was up at the Indra still had us billed as the Silver Beatles. And I remember John, much to everyone, oh, his disgust, mm. took a pen out <laughs> and scribbled silver out and he turned around and said, no, we're, we're not the Silver Beatles anymore, we're the Beatles. And That's great. That was That's the start with being the Beatles. So what was the initial lineup in, in Hamburg? It was, it was the five of you, right? Yeah, five Beatles. Uh, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, uh, Stu Suckett playing bass, and Pete Best on drums. So could you talk a little about Stu Sutcliffe? How did, how did everyone know him, and how did he end up in the band? Well, again, he'd, he'd been a friend of John's at art school. Um, I knew him because he frequented the Casabar when the Quarrymen started playing there. He came down because he was John's friend. Um, he won the John Moore's exhibition um, in Liverpool for, for his hard work. And I think he won either £5 or £10. And I remember one particular night, uh, I remember John and Paul sitting at one of the tables in the Casa Bar trying to persuade Stu to buy a bass guitar. And they were going to, if he bought a bass guitar, they were going to teach him how to play bass. And if they learned him how to play bass, then he could join the band. And consequently, as a result of that, he went out and he did it. He did teach him to play bass. And that's how Stu became a member of the band. Oh, my God. But at this point now, you were considered the fifth Beatle because you, you had joined last, mm -hmm. right? At that point. Um, and how many times in total did the Beatles go and play stints in Hamburg? Total, uh, we went back three times. Three times when I was with them anyway. Uh, we went the first trip, which was August to December. Uh, second trip, which was to the Top Ten Club, which was owned by Peter Eckhorn. Uh, that was from April to June. And then the third trip, um, which was my last trip out with them to Hamburg, uh, was when we opened the Star Club, and that was April to the end of May. Hmm. Of, of 1962? Yeah, yeah. The first one was 1960. Uh, top 10 was 1961. And the Star Club was April 62, yeah. So how how well did you get along with those guys? I mean... Who did you get on best with? Friends with all of them, uh, but always, always turn around and said, and always will turn around and say, you know, closest to John. Um, simply because of the fact that it was, I liked him when I first saw him as a person, the first time I saw him at the Casbah, um, when he came down. And as a result of when I joined the band, um, and even though I was friends with everyone, because you've got to remember, um, the situation we were in, uh, it made us, you know, we were a band 
Five lads from Liverpool in a strange place, uh, San Paoli area, which was the red light district of the world at that time. And here we are playing rock and roll, you know, in the red light district. So, and it was the toughest course for Hamburg. So, you know, we, we had to rely on one another to, to get us through scrapes and, you know, solidarity made us a lot stronger. Um, even though, you know, in the weeks that came, you know, to, as we grew into it um, and we made friends with people, you know, people adopted us and they became our bodyguards, like the waiters, you know, it was, you know, it was nice to have them on your side as well. But even apart from that, um, to, to, I suppose to put, put it into perspective, we had to be a band on stage and we had to be a band off stage as well, you know, to mm -hmm. overcome the... The living problems, the you know the, the the problems that would be set by us, you know, being language problems, you know, being in a, a different place, playing the long hours. There was a lot to adjust to, so we had to, you know, re rely on one another's strengths to actually get through that. And you guys were what? You were in your young twenties, late teens, young twenties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First time out, we were. Uh, George was seventeen. It's the first time, it's on about 1960 now. Uh, I'd be 18. Uh, I think John was 19. Paul was 18. I think Stu may have been 19 or 20, maybe a little bit older than us. But, uh, yeah, when you when you think about it, you know, we were teenagers, basically. Yeah. You know, green-eyed, novice teenagers thrust in the middle of Sin City, and it was like, wow, get on with it, or you're, gonna, you're not going to survive. It was as simple as that. Yes, and those marvelous stories you have to you have to read Pete's book to really <laughs> enjoy those stories. <laughs> but um, what was a typical night like back in those days? Like, what's one of your favorite stories? Favorite stories? Well, oh my goodness me! Um, there, there wasn't so much stories. There was the antics that we used to get up to. Um, you know, out of sheer boredom, and plus the fact that you know because of the. The divan that we used to get up to on stage to entertain the German, German audience and to basically get rid of some of our frustrations and, you know, the boredom of playing, you know, strenuous long hours. Uh, I suppose there was one particular night that, you know, we'd had a couple of drinks and uh, we, we'd taken a 15 minutes off and we decided amongst ourselves that we were, you know, going to dress up as, you know, different different things to put funny things on and all the other bits and pieces. So then you remember, right, we read the Kaiser Keller and, uh, you know, Paul wrapped himself up in a sheet. I think George put a toilet seat around his neck. Um, I put something crazy on. Stu did something crazy. Well, John was the biggest front runner. John went on in a pair of swimming trunks, okay? And we bet John beforehand, and I hope... I don't offend your viewers or your listeners when I turn around and say this, oh, but I'm just trying to cut the scene of the devil and the practice, you know, the the, the things that we used to get up to. Um, yes. Not every night, but just, you know, when when we fancied. Um, no, we'd bet John the fact that he'd gone on with a pair of swimming trunks, that he wouldn't drop his swimming trunks and turn his backside to the audience, okay, while we were playing a number. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, you would never bet John <laughs> Lennon to do anything, right? Because he would do it, right? So in the middle of the number, right, um, which John's singing, uh, he stops, pulls his swimming trunks down, sends his derriere, his backside to the, the audience, right? So that you can imagine, Jen, there's dancers very close to the stage, and then all of a sudden, John's posterior appears in view, right? So, <laughs> do a gasp. We just fell about laughing. Okay. The German audience saw sort the of funny side of it. But the funny thing was, it was the, the, for many, many nights afterwards, consequently, because we'd done that, they thought it was going to become a regular part of the band, right? So they would be waiting oh, oh every gosh. night and all you'd hear them turning around and saying, John, 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 swimming trunks, swimming trunks. Well, yeah, that, you know, yeah, they were the type of things we used to get up to, yeah. All in good fun. All in good fun, yeah, yeah. Now, would you share the story about 
the flaming condoms on the cinema wall. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, we had the offer to go to the Top Ten Club, um, which was a better club on the, on the Reaper Barn, but it was only about 300 yards around the corner from where we were playing. But we realised that Tony Sheridan, who was a big hero of ours, because we'd seen him on English television, and to us he was a rock star. And we realised we could go around in our break and, and watch him, and that's what we did. And one particular night we were sitting there watching him, and Peter Eckhorn came up to us, and he basically went, um, you're the Beatles, and we were very blasé, and he said, yeah, you know. Because by this time we'd changed into this, you know, rock and roll image, and we were in our leathers, and the hair was long, and the cowboy boots, and... You know, we were the kings of Hamburg, you know, we were the top rock and rollers. And uh, we said, yeah. And he turned around and said, well, he said, um, got a business proposition to put to you. So we said, yeah, go on. So he turned around and said, oh, would you like to play at the top 10 club? So we turned around and said, yeah, we'll think about it, right? So we turned around and well, well, I'll pay you more money than you're getting at the Kaiser Keller. So we turned around and said, that's fine. When do you want us to start? Okay. So that was the, you know, the, the fact that we'd swayed that he was going to pay us more money. So, uh, we went back to Bruno Koshmida and Bruno Koshmida basically turned around and said, in no uncertain terms, if you play at the top 10 club, you will never play Germany again, right? And we are five Liverpool lads who don't like to be threatened. So we gave him the Royal Salute which is the two fingers <laughs> salute in Liverpool. And right. off we went to play the top ten club. Lo and behold, Jen, within hours, George was deported for being, or sent home for being underage. We, e.g. Paul and myself, went to the back of the Bambikino where, we, where we'd where we been living. Uh, and we had to basically throw what was left of our belongings into what was left of our suitcases. And there were no lights at the back of the Bambi Kino. And being clean living lads and, you know, um, as I turned around, I said, being in, having to be prepared for anything and being in, you know, the sex city, the, you know, sin city of the world, we were prepared. And, you know, we happened to have some <laughs> condoms on us. And we stuck the condoms on the wall and they lit them and they spluttered and they gave us enough light to basically throw our belongings into a suitcase. And I uh, thought no more about it, went back to the top 10, played the top 10, woke up the following morning. The following morning, we were woken up by two German policemen, yanked off to David Strauss a police station where we were charged with trying to burn the Bambikino down. From there, we were taken to Hamburg jail, the main jail in Hamburg, and we were locked up. And Paul and I thought, my God, this is the end of Pete and Paul. The world is never going to see us again. We're locked up in Hamburg jail. And then we were informed by the uh, the people at the jail that we were going to be deported back home, never to set foot in Hamburg again, uh, which we did, of course. Um, but yeah, so consequently, as a <laughs> result of lighting a couple of condoms and sticking them on the wall, we were booted out of Germany, you know. I never knew condoms were flammable. Thanks for that. <laughs> I've always turned around and said, be splutter, right? But don't <laughs> try them. Don't try it, please. <laughs> okay, we don't want to be kicked out of anywhere else. Just because Paul there and you Pete go. allegedly burnt the Bambi Kino down with a pair of condoms. It doesn't uh, work. It doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> so by the, the end of that first Hamburg trip, things were fractured because George was sent home. He was underage and you and Paul were t deported and accused of arson and and john had stayed back mm -hmm. uh, didn't he as did Stu, who fell in love with astrid kirscher and she was a german photographer and artist who Stu had met there um so can you talk a bit about Stu and astrid and how they were influential in influencing influencing the beatles hairstyle and clothing yeah. well from what I remember, she was on stage. Astrid was going out with Jürgen. Sorry, with uh, Klaus. Um, Klaus Foreman. Klaus Foreman. And Klaus had heard the Beatles before. He'd been attracted by the sound of them when they were in the Kaiser Keller. And he'd gone down and seen it. 
and heard us and he was captivated by what he saw on stage and of course he went back and told that student his his friends um because they were from art college as well and they came down and they they watched the beatles and of course as the love story goes, um, she saw Astrid and fell madly in love and Astrid couldn't take her eyes off Shu. Um, and consequently, the, you know, the romance developed. Um, but as regards the relationship, um, Shu was the first to get his hair combed down. Um, I'm trying to remember the chronological order. Yeah, it was Stu. Um, and that was simply because of the fact he'd, you know, been going out with Astrid and Astrid had combed his hair down and put it into the way that they were wearing it, which was very artsy, which was like the elementary beetle haircut, you know, uh, how it started. And, um, he came back and he basically, you know, wore the hairstyle and we laughed and ridiculed him, you know, but he persevered with it and he, he stayed with it. And then, you know, Astrid used to wear... And her friends used to wear very expensive leathers, very soft leather, um, and we were captivated by that. And it was, again, Stu, under the influence of Astrid, um, started to dress in leathers, um, which again influenced us, because by this time we realised that we couldn't afford the expensive leathers that Astrid was wearing and her friends. Um, but leather was cheap in Hamburg, OK, and by this time our so-called initial stage jackets had fallen to pieces with sweat and ripped and all the shenanigans we used to get up to. And we'd realised that we could get leather jackets, bomber jackets in Hamburg, quite cheap. And we could wear them on stage and we could wear them off stage. We basically lived in them. And we did the same in Liverpool. Um, so hairstyle, she was responsible for, for Stu initially. Then I think George followed suit. Um, he got his hair combed down. And then many, many months afterwards, uh, Paul and John were in Paris and they met Jürgen Vollmer, who was a friend of Astrid and Klaus um, from that initial party that, that had, you know, first seen the Beatles. And uh, when they came back from the, the uh, holiday in Paris, lo and behold, they had, they had the start of what was later to become the Beatles hairstyle, you know. So um, I suppose you could turn around and say that Astrid... Um, Klaus, Jürgen um, were all responsible indirectly in their own sweet ways for, you know, the Beatles going into leathers and hairstyles, you know. But not music, they had nothing to do with that, but, uh, you know, um, style-wise, I think they were initially responsible and then, as years portrayed many, many times, you know, years afterwards you saw the transformation of the Beatles into right. more right. expensive leather, et cetera, et cetera, you know. <laughs> Well, I, I think especially kids nowadays like have no idea of of how important that was because that really encouraged the world over time to for guys to grow out their hair and for it was very proper at the time where you had to have your hair such to where you were judged if your hair wasn't clean cut and is that is that right yeah it was the we got around um <laughs> we came back to liverpool uh because of the you know the, the way we transformed ourselves we had be quite honest and if you look at the early photographs when we came back from liverpool uh, from hamburg on the first trip our hair was long but my god not as long as what it you know people wear it oh, even yeah. today. Uh, I think my hair is even longer now than what it was in those days. Um, but it, yeah. consequently, as a result of that, with the, you know, the Beatles, you know, conquering the world, I think every kid, you know, adopted a Beatle hairstyle and every musician grew held hair down his back as a result of it. So, you know, the whole <laughs> music industry changed consequently, yeah. Yes, it did, it did. In fact, we, I was a very little girl, but we had Beatle wigs. I mean... We actually had beetle wigs. Did you have a beetle so wig? I, I certainly did. Okay. I was, okay. I was three in 1963, and for my fourth birthday, yes, indeed. <laughs> Wowie. So, okay. We have a, yeah, we yeah. have a Gen secret, folks. We have a Gen <laughs> secret. <laughs> so, so when you came back from Hamburg the first time, was that the first time you guys played the cavern? Uh. 
we played the Casbah first, um, but then Mo got in touch with uh, Ray McFall um, because he was running dinner time sessions. And we're talking now around about February 1961. And uh, she persuaded Ray McFall into um, letting the Beatles play a dinner time session. Um, and as a result of that, we were that successful at that dinner time session. It, for those of you who mm. don't know what a dinner time session was, it was something which, for the, the kids and the people who worked in Liverpool City Centre, the cabin was, you know, smack dab in the middle of, you know, uh, centre of Liverpool. So it meant that what, what we call a dinner time session, he, he put a band on and it meant the people in the dinner house could come and listen to the band and relax and then go back to work again. So hence, that's what we nicknamed the dinner time session. Okay, um, but as mm -hmm. a result of that uh, initial booking, um, we went on to play, God knows, many many times at the cabin. You know, as a result of that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So, so was that point when when you guys first started playing the cavern? Is that when the girls started screaming? What was up with that? Because nah, you were we... really popular, like you were the one, and you had a lot of fans, but yeah, so did, did the everyone girls else. Scream? So did everyone else. Okay, let's mm -hmm. be honest about it, you know. But I'd always turn around and say, who the hell they scream for it was immaterial to me because they were screaming for the band. But let's be honest, you know, we'd already got that. The screaming had started a little bit in uh, in Hamburg, okay. Um, so it wasn't just prevalent in Liverpool, but it did increase in Liverpool um, because there was a there was a slightly different audience reaction in Hamburg. Um, amongst the screams, yeah, you know, with it being licensed, um, which Liverpool clubs weren't at that time, um, you had the situation where you had cosmopolitan audiences, you had girls in there, you had prostitutes in there, you had semen in there. So the fan base, the fan reaction, there'd be girls screaming, but alongside girls screaming, there'd be people dancing on the tables. Smashing, smacking beer bottles, you know, stamping on the feet, getting up, dancing in the aisles and all the rest of it. So I think when we came back to Liverpool and we basically conquered Liverpool, um, the scenes that the promoters saw in Liverpool had, had never been seen. It was like, you know, uh, we we played at the Casbah. Um, that was the start of Beatlemania, 19th of December, 1960. Um that was to start a Beatlemania in Liverpool. Um, even though other people turned down and say it started there, it didn't. Okay, the Casbah was the birthplace of the Beatles, and it was also the birthplace of Beatlemania, because the next time that the Beatles played, which was in Liverpool, which was uh, I think Boxing Day at Little and Town Hall, the whole of the Casbah membership, Mo and the club, and the club was empty. The whole of the Casbah membership. Had gone on block to Little and Town Hall to watch the Beatles. That was the incredible drawing force that they had. And the other thing was wow. um, the reaction that the promoters had never seen before. The kids were dancing, okay, boys and girls were dancing. Um, but when the Beatles came on stage and they played the first number, all the girls basically rushed to the front of the stage. Um, now the promoters had never seen that before and mm -hmm. again it was another you know something which made the Beatles so special you know that was the effect they had on the audiences you know um, so yeah you know the, the, the cavern the, the, you know there were screams there but they were getting screams in most of the places these that they were playing at in those days well I totally get it because you know it's it's so exciting you just want to scream and I promise I won't but but I, I I really understand. I mean, we 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 started screaming at the you know for the Beatles. I was a little girl. I I watched my babysitters, you know, screaming, and it was it was a Beatles life at that point. It's real hard to describe to people who weren't alive then that excitement that was just never touched again I think to that to that height I think that's but, I think you just summed it up in one there people who weren't there it's so hard to explain what was going on and what the atmosphere was like and the the excitement that that particular band created you know even when there was a novice band you know 
be God of what the you know, what it transcended into, which is changing the whole face of music industry and becoming most probably the world's most successful and most famous band, and most probably will go down in history as that many many years to come from now. But it's so hard that people weren't there to try and captivate and explain to them the atmosphere, you know. But um, you know, those that were there and were Even fortunate to see it for themselves, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, and I thank God I do. I thank God every day for Beatle music. I mean, it saves lives. It it does. Mm -hmm. So so back in Hamburg, uh, the Liverpool bands that were playing back there were like Tony Sheridan and well, Tony Sheridan Jerry was Pacemakers. Uh, Tony was Norwich. He was a uh, he was he wasn't from Liverpool. He, even though we more or less oh, adopted him as a scouser, okay. Um, but yeah, Liverpool bands that went out. Derry, Derry and the Seniors had already been out there. They were the front, front runner. That was Howie Casey's Seniors. We went out, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, Jerry and the Pacemakers. Uh, and then consequently, most of the bands in Liverpool followed out in different uh, genres, mm. you know. So, so you were also friendly with Ringo Starr at the time when he was playing drums with Rory Storm in the Hurricanes. What was that friendship like? Yeah, friend, just like drummers. Um, you know, we played on the same circuits. Um, I'd known Ringo, or was aware of Ringo because Rory Storm had played in my mother's club, you know, when it opened there in 1959. They were one of the, the first bands after Derry and the Seniors and the Quarry Men and the Black Jacks to basically play there. So I knew Ringo from there, and then, of course, they... Uh, with the next band that went out to Germany, Fallon Williams, uh, for Bruno Koschmieder. So, you know, we spent time in Germany together. And then, you know, we were playing the same circuit in and around Liverpool. You know, we weren't on the same bill. And we, you know, we'd end up hanging out at the cabin in a dinner time session. We seemed to be the, excuse me, the local hangout for, you know, the musicians <laughs> in those days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, it was, a, you know, a drummer's friendship, put it that way, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so let's talk about Brian Epstein. Now, we say Epstein. Do you say Epstein? <laughs> it depends which way you say it. Um, I've always said, and I said it was Brian Epstein. Okay, Epstein. Uh, okay. Simply because of the fact that it, 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 when I was in school and I was learning German, S T E I N was spelled Stein. Okay, Stein. Yeah. Right. Um, I E yeah. was spelled E. Right, so I always go with right, Brian right. Epstein, although other people have called him Brian Epstein. Epstein. Okay. I think I just do because it's an American thing, you know. But uh, we know a lot of Epsteins here. But um, so, so what was it that captured Brian Epstein's attention regarding the Beatles? Can you give a little, like, background about how he was Liverpool-connected? Yeah, Brian was, uh, and his family had, had been in the furniture business um, and they'd gone into the music business and hence he was manager of the Nems Records store, um, smacked up in the middle of town. And uh, we used to frequent there. We used to go there and listen to the, be, be, be quite honest, yeah, we used to go chaos every time we went in because the you know the big girls screaming because the Beatles had gone in to listen to records and the the sales staff the sales girls behind the counter were more interested in the Beatles than serving customers <laughs> and they, they were more interested in playing all the new releases for us so that we could you know listen to them and you know decide what if there was any material there that we wanted to you know rehearse and play before other bands got hold of it um, so he was aware of us uh, but I think because of a lot of people going in and asking for Mike Bonnie, which was the first record that was released and put, um, under the guise of Polydor, um, they basically turned down and said, you know, that Mike Bonnie by the Beatles. And as we find out, consequently now we found out afterwards it was Tony Sheridan and the Beat Brothers, which led to a lot of confusion, but it was sorted mm -hmm. out many, many years afterwards. Yeah. Um, but as a result of that, I suppose curiosity got the factor of him. And he trundled himself off to the cabin one dinner time session, watched what was going on, and basically fell in love with what he saw, you know, these 
poor leather clad louts on stage, you know, laughing and joking, the girls screaming and, you know, playing great music. And uh, he had word with Brian, uh, sorry, with Bob Wooler. And basically turned around and said, uh, if they're interested, I'd like to talk to the boys uh, this afternoon. And Bob Wooler, who was the cabin DJ at that time, passed the word to us. And we trundled off to see Brian Epstein that particular afternoon. And he turned around and put the deal to us, which was, he wanted to become our manager, um, but it was, the way he explained it was, it was a no holds, no holds barred situation, okay? He, he'd never managed the band before, he made that quite clear. He'd managed the record shop, um, so it was something new, but something he felt he could be very successful at. And he basically turned around and said, if it doesn't work for you or it doesn't work for me, either party walks. So he turned around and said, well, that sounds fair enough. Um, so he said, go away, think it over, talk it out with your parents. We did. Consensus of opinion when we got together again was, yeah, he seems to be the guy for the job. And that's consequently how, you know, Brian, we finally agreed that he was going to become our manager. So, so he first tried to get you guys a deal with Decca Records, but that fell through, and then there was interest from EMI. Mm -hmm. um, and how was George Martin connected there? Well, George Martin, to be quite honest, on that first session, the 6th of June, um, because one of the things, one of the conditions, just to explain to people, because people might be thinking to themselves, hang on a minute, they, these guys have already got a recording contract with Polydor, right? Um, one of the conditions we said to Brian uh, when he, we agreed to bring him to manage us was to, because of the uneconomical situation that I'm to go to Germany to record all the time, we wanted an English recording contract. So that was the that was the goal we set him, right? It was, you can come, be, come on, manager, but we want an English recording contract and get us out of the German recording contract because we feel it'd be far more healthier to record in England, which is what he did. And primarily he went to Decca, which was the record company in England at that time, but as history portrays now, we were turned down for Brian Poole and the Tremolos. Um, but as a result of that, we went on to get a re um, record contract with EMI parlor phone division. And uh, on that first occasion, the 6th of June, um, it was Ron Richards and Norman Smith, who were the A&R men on that particular session. And George Martin only came into the session quite late. Um, but it was the first time we'd met him. And, uh, um, you know, he, he talked over and we laughed and joked with him. Um, Brian spoke to him a lot more than what we did. Because um, apparently he'd had conversations with him beforehand, but we weren't aware of that. And uh, it was agreed that, you know, uh, a date would be set in the, the future, uh, that within the next couple of months, for us to go back. And once George Martin had listened to the material, because it was original material that we were playing for him, and he'd decide um, what was going to be recorded and how it was going to be recorded, uh, a future date would be set for us. Um, and we went away, happy as, you know, happy as we could be because we got the recording contract. We were due to go back and put the finishing touches, which was what was going to be our first English release, first major English release. Um, but unfortunately, I never made it back to that uh, consequential recording session. Because of that faded conversation that you had with Brian... Can you touch upon that just a little bit? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't want to dwell on it a lot because it's been well chronicled, Jen, over the years, and, you know, so many people have misinterpreted and of course. even people today. But, yeah, to put it in a nutshell, you know, because I'm, you know, I've always been outspoken about it. And, you know, it's like people make their own decisions up about, you know, whether they feel it's valid or it's not, but, you know, that, that, that's Beatle folklore and you're part of Beatle folklore and how <laughs> so it's, you know, everyone has their own opinions. Um, and that's that's what the world's all about, you know. If we were all sure. taught the same, then we'd all be clones and we'd all be acting exactly the same, you know. So life would be very, very boring. Um, it would yes, for me anyway. Indeed. indeed. Going back to what you said, Vien, uh, that 
fateful meeting with Brian was very much a case of no forewarning. I think that that's the the element after all these years is most probably the, the great factor. You know, that whatever had been discussed, I wasn't privileged to it. I was called into Brian's office. And uh, I could tell that he, he was very uneasy, which wasn't the normal Brian, because... Prior to that, I'd had brain picking sessions with Brian because I'd handled the business side of things for a while. Only as regards, you know, getting bookings and taking bookings and talking to promoters. So it was just a case he'd, he'd use me as a springboard and send out and say, you know, what's this promoter like, Pete? And what do you think we should pay? You know, ask for. Sure. And I thought it was another one of those. But when I went in, I could tell that Brian was like, mm, something. Something strange, he's very edgy, very uneasy, he wasn't as cool, calm, relaxed self. And then he just basically came out, turned around and said, Peace, he said, I have no other way of putting this to you. Um, he said, uh, uh, it's been left up to me. Um, so I turned around and said, well, what is it that you, you, you're trying to say, Brian? So he turned around and said, well, he said, what it is, he said, it's already been arranged that um, Ringo will join the band on Saturday and you are no longer going to be part of the Beatles and you're going to be replaced by Ringo Starr. Well, that was the bombshell, Jen, but okay, after being known for three and playing with for two years and achieving all the success and going through all the changes with them, it was a bit of a bombshell, which did leave sure. me a little bit tongue-tied. Um, and I basically said, yeah, Brian, if that's what it is. But I did ask, you know, where are the others? How come it wasn't, you know, it was left up to you? And Brian basically turned out and said, because he was the manager, boys felt it was his responsibility to convey the bad news to Pete. And they didn't want to be there in case trouble broke out. Okay. Mm, oh, um, oh, my. It was one of those. Um, there was a phone call, which I believe was from Paul McCartney. Um, asking whether Brian had basically told Pete, um, Brian turned around and said, I'm in the process of telling Pete now. Uh, and that, that was the end of that conversation. But as the world both phrase now, you know, um, Ringo came sure. in, Love Me Do was released in October. That's what we turn around and say in the music industry, the rest of musical history, Jen, you know, from Love Me Do. History, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. went on to conquer the world. Now, in subsequent years that followed, how, how did you emotionally recover from that loss? To be quite honest, it initially it gave me a lot of heartbreak because of what I'd been through and, you know, the support I'd given to the band and I thought they'd do with friends. Um, financially, I was embarrassed, you know, because I'd been one of the top eight bands in Liverpool and then all of a sudden you you know, having to reinvent yourself and you're not asking the same price when you join other bands, etc. So, you know, you have to rebuild your life again. And it, it, I've always turned around and said for quite some time, it, it, it took a lot to get over. Um, but there, there comes a time in life and I think it happened. You know, um, don't, don't get me wrong, it didn't happen a couple of weeks afterwards or the day after or anything like that. It, it took a period of time, I'm talking about a couple of years. Because you're still sure. involved in yourself in the music industry, you've still, you know, joined another band. Um, Lee Curtis and the old stars, you've formed your own band, you've got your own recording contract. Um, so you are redeeming yourself, you are, you know, turning around and saying to people, okay, well, regardless of what happened, you know, I'm still here and I'm still surviving and I'm still in the music industry, you know, trying to create my own legend. Um, but it was very much a case of, when I realised that it was pointless looking back and reflecting on what could have been, what should have been, what may have been, okay, that was gone. Mm -hmm. You couldn't change it. Nothing's going to change that at all whatsoever. So if you keep reflecting back on that, you are going to end up a very bitter and twisted man. Right. And you have to get to grips with the situation and realise it's not about what happened yesterday. It's very much about today and tomorrow. And once I came to grips with that situation, then I realized that it was like, fine, you know. Yeah. I believe in karma. Yeah. And I think because of my belief in karma, there's certain things which happen in life which you don't understand at that present moment in time. Mm. 
Um, but consequently, as, as the tapestry grows and the road gets longer and you live your life long, you look back at it and it's happened for a reason. And as far as I'm concerned, it happened for a reason because uh, lots of things have compensated in life because of that. Um, you know, I've gone on to have, you know, my own degree of success. I'm a great family man. I've got a lovely wife, a little cool girl who I've been married to for 61 years. I've got two beautiful daughters, four wonderful grandchildren, which I absolutely idolise and spoil. And I will do <laughs> while I'm still on the planet. I'm not, not ashamed to turn around and say that. I've been fortunate, you know, I've, I've had a modicum of success. I've had, you know, I've had record success, I've had book success. Um, so life's been good to me, Jen, you know, so it, it's yeah. one of those things, yeah, you know, yeah. where, you know, let's not reflect on, yes, it was great to be part of the biggest band in history. I can always hold my head up high and turn around and say thank you. I can always wear that badge. Um, but take me for what I am today, you know. Not for what it was many, many years ago. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if people do that, then they'll turn around and say, okay, you know, Pete's not the bitter and twisted old person that uh, some of the media makes out to be. You know, he's a very, you know, humorous and easygoing and family man who enjoys life. I totally get that from you. <laughs> I totally get that feeling from you. And, and, and on a lovelier note, yes, you're a wonderful family. His daughters, granddaughters. I mean, my gosh, what a gift. So now That's why you've it's in that toured. Of yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for that because there are people out there struggling with disappointment and, you know, just knowing that you've shared that is very helpful. So, so thank you. Now, you've toured extensively with your own band for years, and you're still playing music. <laughs> in fact, you're playing in the U.S. at the end of this month, July of 2024. Yeah. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, we're doing a very, very quick tour to the States, um, end of July. Uh, we're doing four dates. Uh, Friday the 26th, we're at Weekend at Birthdays, which is in Delaware. Then we're moving down on the 27th to Club 66, which is in Maryland. And then we've got two dates in Ohio. Um, 28th, we're at the Valleydale Ballroom in Columbus, Ohio. And the 29th, we're at Kent Stage in Kent, um, which will be our final final show for this particular trip. Because then Rogue and me are catching the red eye uh, to get back to Liverpool as fast as we can because we're, first of August, we'll be launching the Casbah Coffee Club Suites, which is our new yes. Airbnb, um, which we're very proud of the fact it's it's above the Casbah in Liverpool, which is the birthplace of the Beatles. And yes. Rogue and I have converted the family home, this beautiful Victorian mansion, into five gorgeous suites, luxurious suites, um, which is available through Airbnb. You know, we're taking bookings now. And the bookings were very glad to say, coming in, so thank you, thank you, but please keep them coming in. Uh, but just an aside, Jenny, um, the five suites, uh, we've called them the uh, McCartney Suite, the Lennon Suite, Harrison Suite, Sutcliffe Suite, and of course the best suite. And it's unique simply because of the fact you're going to stay where the Beatles played. You're going to stay where the Beatles rehearsed. You're going to stay where the Beatles partied. You're going to stay where the Beatles slept. You're going to stay where the Beatles had fun. You're going to stay where the Beatles frolicked. Had good times. Okay, so if there are any Beatles fan that's out there and they're available to come here, then it's a must on your booker list that you come and book in and stay at the Caswell Coffee Club Suites. Okay. For those yes, of you yes. who are non beatle fans, and there are a few out there, believe you me, <laughs> um, come and see us anyway, because it's a historical building, it's a heritage, grade two listed building, okay, and it, it's steeped in history. It's in a wonderful part of Liverpool, West Derby Village, which is steeped in history. You know, we've got the courthouse, we've got the stocks, we've got the, the church, we've got the old castle. Come and see us, okay. August 1, we're all okay, but... Check us out on Airbnb, please. Okay. 
is so exciting. I just have to like tell you from a fan's perspective, oh my gosh, that I could actually go there to where the Casbah Club was, to where all of it happened and and stay. Yeah. I, I just blows me away. I'm definitely coming. I hope so. Also, I hope so. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you you guys also have a few other things happening. You have an official sweets launch. So the Casbah Coffee Club suite launches on August 1st mm -hmm. of 2024. Oh. And it's an opening celebration. Yeah. So the yeah. launch of this one in a kind, one of a kind hotel. Um, tickets are free. And so if you're planning to be in Liverpool, you got to go. The other thing is mm. you can actually win two nights stay in the Harrison suite. And it's by, um, it's via a raffle. It's an actual mm. raffle. Um, so you can get a raffle number, buy with a ticket. And the um, UK National Lottery is going to choose uh, who wins. Um, also, we have to make mention, Pete, of the Liverpool Beetle Museum. So you, you guys, whoever's in Liverpool, uh, you have to go um, on Matthew Street. Um, and it har houses the largest beetle collection in the world. A must when you're visiting Liverpool, for sure. So, um, so the links to Pete's concert dates at the end of the month the Casbah Coffee Club, Airbnb Suites, and how to book, because Rogue did a little video on how to actually get to that. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. those links to that, the free tickets to the Casbah Coffee Club Suite official launch, a chance to win a two-night stay at the Harrison Suite, and the Liverpool Beatles Museum, um, and both a link to both how to get your book and the rogue and your book mm -hmm. um, is all on the rock and healthy lifestyles dot com website and in the show notes to this episode. So a quick couple more quick questions is what kind of music do you listen to now? Oh, I listen to everything that's good. Um, my range goes from. Oh, Latin American to jazz to big band to rock and roll, blues, country and western. I've, done, I've got an open ear to everything. Okay. My, I suppose the easiest way of putting it, if it's good, I'll listen to it. If it's bad, <laughs> I won't go anywhere near yeah. it. But deep yeah, down yeah, yeah. at the end of the day, I'm still a stone in the wall, old rock and roller. <laughs> that's, that's what I want to hear. Do you, is it vinyl, you play CDs or do you stream? Oh, I play both. I've got vinyl and uh -huh. CDs, and uh, uh, don't stream so much. I leave that with the uh, the mm -hmm. grandchildren. They entertain mm -hmm, me with the mm -hmm. streaming and choice of records. But <laughs> my collection is very much CD and vinyl orientated, Jen. Yeah, ditto. Yeah, and to put you on the spot, what are your thoughts on today's popular music? Yikes. Uh, I think my own personal opinion. And I think it's a good thing as well. Uh, it tends to be going back to grassroots. I'd love to think that, mm. um, you know, a lot of the new bands which are coming along, Liverpool and bands which have heard, you know, American bands and German bands and, you know, bands universally, um, you know, that are playing the, what we turn around and call the old Mersey beat stuff or the old American crowd, you know, the old uh, grassroots country and Western old grassroots blues. Um, for a while, I went to, uh, okay, how could you turn down and say it? That sounds, sounds incorporated state. And by sounds incorporated, I mean, you know, uh, stereo effects and, you know, um, uh, you know, drum pans and drum machines and, you know, sounds and, you know, um, you know, it wasn't a true, it wasn't a true musicianship anymore. It wasn't a man standing on stage or a woman standing on stage playing a guitar. Right. But I'm glad to say right. that even though that was still going on, from what I, I seem to be getting, um, which I love, is that, you know, the people that are playing music now tend to be going back and going back to grassroots level and enjoying playing that type of music, bringing live music and raunchy music back to the audiences yeah. again. 
so they can participate in it, you know. So it, it's great from, from that point of view that, you know, I think the bands are taking audiences into consideration um, again, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, a two-way thing, I think, you know. Very interesting. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I have a Facebook group called Music Hacks for Mental Health, mm -hmm. and one of the members, Jeff Ballenberg, wanted to ask you this question. What are your, what are you most proud of in terms of your contributions to the Beatles? My contribution to the Beatles? Uh, I suppose the easiest way, Jeff, to answer that one is not a particular contribution. The fact that I was privy to be part of that particular band when we achieved so much over such a short period of time. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, going out to Germany, conquering Germany, coming back from Germany, conquering Liverpool, getting a recording contract in Germany, Brian Epstein signing us, old stepping stones, um, going on to play on BBC, Teenagers 10, doing television, getting a recording contract. They were all milestones, you know, so... Yeah. I couldn't put my hand on my heart and turn around and say that was the particular contribution that Pete made, okay? I'd like to yeah. turn around and say that as, a, as regards a contribution, that if I looked at it solely, okay, um, possibly in the initial days, the early days, I had a drum sound which helped elevate them into a, from a mediocre band into this great rock and roll band, which the world was privileged to see, you know, way back in the, the 60, 62 period. I suppose that's the answer. That's the only answer I can give at the moment, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Pete Best, thank you. It was an honor. Thank you so much for coming on Rock and Healthy Lifestyles and sharing so much of these magnificent memories and, and experiences with me and the listeners. You definitely have profoundly touched the lives of so many so deeply. Pete Best, you're my favorite Beatle, and I promise I won't scream. <laughs> Jen, for all your listeners and for you personally, okay, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for asking me to come on. Okay, it's been lovely chatting to you, and uh, long may the friendship continue. And you've got a book in to the Casbah Coffee Club Suite. Yes, definitely. Thank there you, you so much. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm freaking out. How'd I do? Isn't he a great guy? It is a dream come true. Thank you so much for tuning in and please help my channel grow by liking, subscribing, and hit that notification bell to alert you for new episodes. I could never do this without your support. So thank you for tuning in. And you can find show notes, more episodes, and a lot more on my website, rockandhealthylifestyles.com. That's rock, the letter N, healthylifestyles.com. And come join me on my Facebook group, Music Hacks for Mental Health. See you soon. Oh my gosh. I'm going to scream. <laughs>